Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a fireside chat with Zany Mystic. I'm your host, Lance White. <clears throat> Tonight's guest is Din Dayal Morgan. Din Dayal is the director and founder of Pathfinder Institute, School of Yoga, Heart, Meditative Movement, and is a certified Kriya Yoga Swami. His recent book, Lone Wolf in the Company of Fools and Mystics, recounts his spiritual journey as an African-American born into the welfare system. It relays his victories over racism, a dysfunctional family, and sexual abuse, which are all transformed through spirituality with heart. Let's learn more about this remarkable journey by welcoming him to the show. <laughs> Hi, Din Dayal. How are you? Greetings. <laughs> yes, thank and you. And did I pronounce your name right? Is it Din Dayal? Yes, yeah, Din Dayal. Yes. Din Dayal, okay. Um, you know, I really loved your book. Thank you. It, it, it just it touched my heart, and the, I loved all the pictures of your family and, and the various other things that you put in there and, and um, you know, meetings with your spiritual masters. It, it was really a, a warm, it, it, I just felt like I connected, you know. Thank you. And yeah. there were many events in your life that were similar to mine, although, you know, you have a different uh, skin color. You know, some of these things are just uh, translate into, you know, we're humans. We're in the human experience, uh, Spirituality 101. Truly, truly. So uh, let's find out more about your journey and when did it begin? Um, tell us when you started to... Well, um, I would say that um, when I was... Um, I would say like around 14, they, you know, I was, I mean, it was always, um, I always wondered in the early years um, why people did what they did. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was naivety or whatever it was, but for example, um, I was brought up in the church and and there was, uh, <clears throat> there was an aspect of the church that always, you know, I thought, well, maybe this is the way to this thing called God. But what I was observing in this young age was I was observing people behind the scenes doing things that were, um, it just didn't go together with what they were saying at the pulpit. Uh. And it made me realize that everyone, and I didn't have, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't very articulate in being able to speak because I had a speech problem in the early years of my life uh. up until around, around 12, 13. And I couldn't talk, so I've always I couldn't say anything to anyone. So I was I used to observe those kind of things, and I was wondering. People don't always say what they do, and they don't always do what they say. Uh -huh. And that was the first assumption. So it put me on this interesting quest to find some type of sense out of out of the madness that I saw. Uh -huh. It didn't make sense. You know, you know, give and take. I, I was a young guy at that time, but I felt that. If if a person, you know, in, in the early years, children, you know, they go by what you say. The minute you start lying to them or you say things and you don't follow through with them, uh -huh. uh, they begin to develop their own way because you're the first impression that they see in the early years. Uh -huh. And my mother, she, you know, bless her soul, she, she did the best she could, but at the age of 16 she had me. And my father, he really wasn't, he didn't really know how to be present. And so it sort of gave me this whole thing of, I need to find some kind of answers, you know, and I had the opportunity. I could have went through totally the other way, you know, and really got involved with the law of crime, you uh -huh. know, but I did not, you know, I just, I didn't totally go into that, that arena. Good. So, you know, and then uh, as I, as time progressed it, I started to look at actually other aspects of, um, more so, um, the teachings and different teachings and the questioning, you know, the whole, uh, the thing behind fire and brimstone and this, the fear tactics that was used to get you to believe. And and that didn't make sense either. I just, there was something about it, and I couldn't really say much because I would probably get slapped down if I questioned anything <laughs> too much. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I began to see, uh, as I started to progress and go into those fields, I, I just really just wanting to find some answers. And I think that one of the turning points, I feel, that was, it was actually when I just said out loud, and I've said this, and I said this, and I was standing in a church, and I said, please reveal yourself to me. If there is, if, if it is the thing called God, hmm. uh, show itself. Reveal me in a way that I can understand it, because 
now, you know, I don't understand anything. I, I don't really know what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, because I've seen the things that happen behind the scenes, and I just, and I've also been a victim of those things behind the scenes. So it's like, hmm, you know. And so the, it put me on the quest to really find the self. And so, I mean, if I could say as time progressed, um, it got me involved with the studies of uh, mysticism, and um, it was it was almost as if you know when your mind is, is is sort of fixed in a certain point where what you're looking for and what you you really want to find there's a way in which the universe has a way of opening up to you and it directs yeah. you towards you it's you know it's called the law of attraction as you uh -huh. know most definitely. Um, what were some of those ex early experiences? Um, you briefly touched upon it, and I know that in, in some of the Catholic Church, there's quite a bit of abuse of, uh, you know, the young boys in the Catholic Church. I don't know which church you grew up in, but uh, is that the kind of thing that was going on where the, uh, the preachers would be preaching about, uh, you know, sin and, and so on and so forth, and then behind the scenes they'd be, you know, having in incestuous... Uh, sexual things with yeah. kids? Yeah. That's okay. Right. And that was pretty common. It's pretty common. Matter of fact, what most people don't know, and I think uh, I think some of the listeners out there would also verify this, that um, there's a lot of things that were happening, not just only in the Christian um, you know, arena, but there were things that happened behind the scenes and some of the, uh, like even one in the early Harry Krishna group movement, they had their thing going on and then there's other things that are going on and other groups, um, you know, even this in, in forms of Islam, there are many things that are happening in any organized organizations or organized religious groups that are always something that um, sometimes is not spoken. Mm -hmm. And then you even find these certain things that are um, sometimes in ashrams. And people say, "Wow, washrooms!" You know, uh, <laughs> if it's not if it's not properly structured and it's kind of loose, yeah, uh, you you can anything can come up, anything yeah. can happen. Oh yeah. yeah, I've heard that, and it often does. <laughs> definitely, <Most> definitely. <laughs> especially <clears throat> Rajneesh was one of those. I guess there were some pretty wild times there. Oh yeah, yeah. Even the esoteric school that I was involved with. I didn't. He, I didn't find out till years later. We were studying Gurdjieff and Aspensky, and um, that I didn't find out until after I'd left that the teacher was seducing the young young men, and uh, and their sons, oh and uh, blackmailing them into having you know forcing them to have sex, or else he'd, they'd have to leave the school. And the impression was that if you in a school you have a possibility of evolving and, and being spiritual, and if you leave a school, you're dead. Hmm. You know, so that at that point, I think a school becomes a cult. Yes, it does. And you know, I think most of them are cults anyway. Yeah, and, and, but, it, you know, here's the thing that lands that most people don't, I mean, we're talking about a subject that is very secret and hush-hush, and because we're bringing this out like this, um, there's a lot of people out there that are listening that really can relate to this. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it's time now to, to really get it to the forefront and yeah. forgive, let go, and move on. Yes. And, I, you know, I know it's not it's easier said than done, but <clears throat> there's a way in which, you know, there are certain things that have happened to one's, in one's personal life that it's actually a signpost. It's, it's a way in which, okay, I've been through this now. How can I use this to help others? Right, How can right. I share this with other people that this will not happen to any young people because one of the most traumatic traumas in those stages when you're young like that, yeah. it takes, you know, you don't really understand. So right. here you're going through life and you're going through all types of unnecessary traumas and dramas and, you and know, you have therapy. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so what do you recommend? I mean, how can uh, people who have had those traumatic experiences begin to heal them as part of their spiritual path? I think, I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've felt, and this is one of the things that I have observed over the 40 years of teaching, is that one of the things that is more prevalent is this thing called movement. Um, 75 to 80 percent of all communication is based upon body language. Mm. And the rest is based upon tonization, how people use words. Uh -huh. Now, understand the nature of the body language, wind, water, ground, fire, 
space. I'm using principles based upon the shamic. Now, uh, in Ayurvedic, we talk about Vitta, Pitta, and Kappa. You know, but they they still use the same elements. But from this standpoint, this is more of a shaman point point of view, which is more people can more grasp the concept. And so, when you look at wind, water, ground, fire, and space, space is just the thing that holds all these things together. You start to look at what element am I? How can you know, once you, uh, you know I can you know what you do? We go through a certain specific movements, which takes about five or six minutes. And as you go through that movement you begin to re relate to the type of element you are. And as you go through that element, one of the things that you do, you, you know how you, you begin to realize how you hold on to elements. I'll give me an example of what I'm saying. Uh, one of the things is this. If, if the listeners out here, mm -hmm. if they relive an experience, a very traumatic experience, notice where they feel it at. When they feel it, because a lot of us hold what we call traumas or past pains in certain parts of our body. Mm -hmm. Some people, when they get really trauma, they hold, they, re they, they relive an experience. Some people's stomachs, they get very nauseated. Oh, that's mine. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's been like that all day long, too. And then some people, when they have that, their throat starts to, to close up. Yeah. yeah. And then some people have this, the, the back starts, they, they start having problems with their back. They start feeling very painful in their back. And these are these are actually areas. It's called cellular memory, where yeah, we hold yeah. on to those particular traumas. Mm -hmm. Now, when you find a place where you hold it, that you place your hands over that particular part of your body, and as you place your hands over that particular part of your body, you give yourself a declaration, and you say to yourself, "I give myself permission to let go." And people say, "Oh, yeah, if that was that easy, boy, that ah, that would have been gone a long time ago." But what most people don't understand on this world of what we call gross matter. When you make a manifestation or want to change something, it takes a little bit more time. Uh -huh. Now, in reality, the realistic time, it will take approximately about 30 days, or within 30 days, that you keep repetitively saying this constantly. It's been about, I would say, at least um, 15, 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes twice a day. Okay. In the morning time before you retire, and keep giving yourself that direct declaration. You say it out loud vocally, because okay. when you say it vocally, what happens is your subconscious picks it up. And there's a problem. when you first start off, your mind say, "This is stupid." No, right. you're not. No, you still feel the pain. This is ridiculous. But what what most people don't understand is that normally when you keep doing that, and you keep doing it over and over again, you set up a pattern uh -huh. called self-talk. And as you keep setting up that pattern your body will start to register it, uh. and it will actually start to let go. It will actually let go. And you'll find in between those 30 days, as you touch that area of your body and give that declaration, I give myself permission to let go, something in those, within those 30 days will lift, as if something was lifted off your body, a heaviness will leave from that area. And I'm telling you, it works. It's one of the most powerful techniques. Well, I'm going to try that because I just uh, took on, uh, I just was involved with a situation, I won't go into the details, but um, where I had an opportunity to be a victim, and uh, where there was a, I was lied to or manipulated, and uh, it's a very unpleasant feeling. So, you know, I carry all that in my stomach, you know, because my, my, empathic, my empathic skills always warn me through my stomach. So I'm going to try that for 30 days and see how that works because it's so simple. Definitely, definitely. And I have heard that these things work, but you need to consistently do it for at least consistency. That's one of the key. Or thirty days. Yes. Um, another question: uh, What advice do you have for those uh, who might uh, be in dysfunctional homes? Because let's face it, there are a lot more dysfunctional homes now than there are <laughs> normal homes, or living in poverty. And how did you work through your uh, situation and not become a victim. How did you work through your victim consciousness? One of the things that I did, I woke up one day, and not so much as woke up out of a sleep getting up, but as I was walking through life, <clears throat> something dawned on me. And what dawned on me is that none of this stuff was making sense that I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I grew up in the welfare system. Uh, my grandparents were in the welfare system. Mm -hmm. my mother was in the welfare system. I was in the welfare system. So it's like, why am I doing this? I asked the question, 
why am I subjecting myself to this? And I really feel, I really genuinely feel that it had a lot to do with my search. Uh -huh. sense. Now, there are other people around me that have grew up in that same situation, but their mind was not focused on anything. Matter of fact, they thought it was okay, you know, to swim on the system or to manipulate or cheat the system. Right, you right. Know, they thought it was okay. Yeah. You know, and if I would make a gesture, oh, I'd say, hey, don't you want to stop this? Well, maybe sell some drugs. No, that's not the way either. Right. So what do you think, man? Well, find a way in which you do something that you really enjoy doing, something right, that right. gives you great joy. And just do that. Oh, well, there ain't no really immediate money in it, man. I don't want to do that. And I say, no, just just do it. You know, just see if it works for you. See how it see how it goes. You know. So what it did, it put me on this quest to really make a change. And so what I did, I wound up working three jobs. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, my third job was the thing that I really loved, but I had to work in order to pay the bills and keep the family together. I, you know, I had to do a whole bunch of things in order to get to that point. Uh -huh. But as, I, as time moved on, I kept making this affirmation and this declaration to myself that I don't know, I don't know, please reveal to me what I need to know. Mm -hmm. And then as time moved on, that's when I met my spiritual teacher in 1971. Mm. And that started to change because I, I was putting out this call for help. And I guarantee you, those of you that are listening out there in Radio Land, one of the things that you really need to understand that when the student is ready, the yeah. teacher will appear. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there has to be a conviction from the heart, a cry from the heart that, please, send the teacher to help. I need to move on. I need to to find this aspect. Teach me. Share with me. And those things will start to manifest. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things also um, that I there is another key uh, implementation that you can use when you're stuck in what we call a negative relationship, as well as being in in, in what we call a, a whole house environment that is really not beneficial to you mm -hmm. and you feel like you're the sort of like the black sheep of the family or you feel like am I really why was I born into this family <laughs> they're crazy as hell uh -huh. you know and one of the things you start to one of the things that you have to do if you're young you have to look at okay you know what I need to step away from this and I need to surround myself with people that that support or people that have the likeness of mine and if I continue to hold that thought in my mind, you will actually attract it. You'll find yourself one day involved with a group of people that are like mine. Uh -huh. The mind, what people have forgotten, the mind is a magnet. Whatever you constantly think on, whatever you hold on to your mind, you will attract. Mm -hmm. You will attract. And so the, it's very important what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. It's the old saying, if you go in somebody's room, and you look on the stuff they have on the walls, and if it happened to be a whole bunch of pictures of naked women, you can pretty much know where the person is at in their mind. Right, right. You know, and so what we hold in our household and what we have on our walls is a reflection of our subconscious self mm -hmm. and is a reflection of what we, how we do in life. And so it's imperative that you surround yourself with things and people that support a higher level of consciousness. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, in 1971, when you met this teacher, what uh, path did he follow, and what did he rec recommend for you? What kind of uh, teaching did you follow initially? Well, initially it was um, Kriya Yoga, but prior to that, I had several teachers. Uh, one was um, was very unusual. He was um, let's put it this way: he he practiced the dark art. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. And um Danger I, I Will Robinson. <laughs> yeah. I didn't write uh, I really didn't put too much in the book about that because that would take I've met people place. who practice that and it's it's really scary stuff. I know, I know. And he was very much in the, in that uh, particular order. Um things that I saw him do. Oh. And I actually I you know, he took me in and sort of worked with me on that, but that was a very short aspect of time. I mean, it lasted for several years, uh -huh. and um, I learned a lot about what people can do and what they really can't do, uh -huh. you know, and that was one of the early years of training from that thing, and I left that because it, it just wasn't, I felt it just wasn't right. 
Yeah, yeah. So I moved on. To, and there were other several teachers and things and people that owned Dona, but the major teacher was uh, my uh, the teacher that I met in, in through the Temple of Kriya Yoga of Chicago. Uh, his name was Goswami Kriyananda, and his teacher was Shelley Trimmer, and Shelley's teacher was Paramahansa Yogananda. Mm. So I come from that particular lineage. So wonderful. And that's where, you know, that's where I really began to study. Even then, when I first started off, uh, there was a way in which the, the teachings really confronted uh, my fears and it confronted things that I didn't want to look at as I, as I was walking and, and going through it. I had, prior to that, I had started martial arts back in 1966, and I became very efficient, you know, in that field, in, in kickboxing and the whole concept, you know, and you know, but when seventy, it it changed a whole bunch of things in the way of how to look at um, the fighting aspect. And I still kept the martial science back. I still kept that together. People are often that would say, "Well, you know, you're doing this yoga and doing you're doing this martial arts. Isn't this a contradiction? Uh, ahimsa, you know, nonviolence." And most, most people don't understand. We're all soldiers in a battle. It's not so much as what you're doing is your intention behind why you why you're doing it in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I began to realize the balance, and I kept the martial. But I, you know, I started looking at the balance of the martial science and, and how it fits in, and how you know the intention and energy and movement plays a major role in how what's going on internally from a microscopic level uh -huh. inside of our bodies, because we're constantly fighting what we call antibodies and, and other things that are going on, foreign things that are not really conducive. It's called the immune system. You know, there are cells that are dying and rebirthing again. Uh, and if they don't defend you, you're in trouble, you know. And so and on, that, on that small scale inside of our bodies, what, what do we make, you know, does it really make that much difference in what's happening on the outside? Because there's a lot of things going on, on the outside. It, every time you step out the door, every time you, you turn on anything or look at anything, there's always someone or something that's subliminally programming or sending something to you or selling you something or telling you how to yeah. look. Because we're living in the world of images. Yeah, you're right about that. Oh, by the way, those of you listening to this, uh, you know, you can always go to my website, pathfinerinstitute.com. That's pathfinerinstitute.com. You can also call me, if you wish, at 925-695-3121. That's 925-695-3121. Good. <clears throat> And you work with clients uh, today, yes? Yes. And what, what do, how do you work with them? Are you teaching some of the mixtures of the various spiritual uh, pursuits, or is it yes. more of the martial arts side, or a little bit of all of it? It's a little bit of all of them. Well, I'll give me an example. Um, my, some of my major clients that I'm working with now um, is uh, people with addiction. You know? Okay. Oh, good, because I had a problem. You know, I worked through my addictions years ago, so I know this is a very big area. Definitely. definitely. What, how do you how do you uh, do your work with addiction? When when you when you're working with addicts, one of the things that most people don't quite understand is that because of their drug addiction, whether it was meth or whether it was cocaine or heroin or marijuana, whatever it may be, uh, one of the things that happens in, in the long term addict is using. There's a way in which they leave their bodies. Um, they constantly are altering their consciousness and either shifting down into the lower astral uh -huh. or somehow shifting into a place where they start to see things a little differently. Uh -huh. Because of the long-term usage, they develop what we call, in some ways, a thin skin, their level of sensitivity they begin to feel. Now, based upon the type of usage of the drug that they're using, there's a way in which either something starts to deteriorate something starts to really affect the body in a way where either they become paranoia uh -huh. or either they become physically ill. Things start, to ha things start not, not working as, as well. Right. But my point is this, is that what happens is they become very astute. They may not be, be, and they may not be able to be articulate in explaining what they're feeling, but they do it. Just like when I'm working with youth. And I'm working with the youth, it's, it's very, very beneficial because they can feel where I'm coming from. Uh -huh. I don't have to use a whole bunch of words. And so when I'm working with people in addiction, I use movement as a key, you know, based upon uh, my Omoto Misashi's work, Book of the Five Rings, and it has to do with the elements. And I have them go through the elements and feel aspects of themselves. 
like I incorporate the principle of the posture, and as I hold the posture, I move them in from a, what we call a therapeutic point of view, mm-hmm. and ask them, okay, notice what you're feeling while you're holding it. Notice your breath. Is your breath steady? Notice how, how much you inhale and how much do you exhale. See if you can keep it even from that point. Notice what you're feeling in the body, part of the body that you're stretching. Now, touch that area, relax into it, breathe into it. And this happens just to be in the present moment. Uh-huh. And then from that point, I take them to a series of movements that involve what we call fear, moving past the fear, uh-huh. and ask them, okay, I want you to relive an experience of using. Now, for some of them, it's, they're terrifying. Uh-huh. So if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you let me know. But I'm here, and I can give you something to counteract it. And I have them go through a experience when they want to use. Mm. And the minute, because the body is programmed, it's pre-programmed for the years of usage, some people start feeling in parts of their back. Some people, their hands start to sweat, literally sweat, because they're getting ready to use. Okay, I said, now, stop for a while as you're holding it. Intensify it to a point where you feel like you can actually go use. Now, while you're feeling it, notice everything that's going on. And what I do, I give them a series of what we call acupressure points that I tell them to do to themselves. Like, for give you an example, push your tongue against your teeth. And as you push your tongue against your teeth, place your, your, your left hand underneath your right rib cage Ooh. and hold it there. Now, it varies from one person to another. And because I'm an intuitive, what it is, I feel exactly what they need to do in order to counteract that particular movement. Now, in some cases, they can tell them to put their both hands in t- right up underneath the sternum and push it in there because a lot of times, a lot of the trauma they take place and when, 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 people, when people get into that place of trauma, they start to feel it in their tummy. And so what happens, if they can push against those nerve, um, nerve endings that are in the aspect of the tummy, they can neutralize a lot of the triggers and combine with a certain position of the tongue that can actually alter it and it can soften the usage. And so those are some of the techniques, but see, like I say, they vary from one person to another, mm-hmm. but they're always, always 99.9% correct. What, uh, what is the uh, most common uh, drug that seems to be ab- abused today that you see with your clients? Well, I would say uh, meth. Yeah, yeah. Meth yeah. is a, it's a crazy drug because it, it, it also stems and it gets into violence. Um, I mean, all drugs can leave it that way, you know. But meth is, uh, it, it screws around, and I mean, all drugs can mess with the, the gray matter in the brain. Right. But meth has this, has another, it does something else, it really is. Um, those are one of the things. And then um, cocaine, you know, those kind of things like that. Yeah. Now, um, what about uh, overcoming other aspects like there are some very common things that we're going through now, like depression, anger, and fear. What kinds of uh, techniques do you use for overcoming those? One of the things that you can do is called, uh, um, this is the term they use for it is called the warrior approach. And um, you face the fears by standing in the upright position. And as you stand in the upright position, slightly bend the knees, and as you slightly bend the knees, go into the mind. It's called time travel. Oh. Time travel is called memory because we all go back in time and we go to different points of experiences <laughs> and relive the experience of that fear. Just relive it. And as you relive it, notice where you start to feel it and what parts of the body. What parts of the body do you feel it? And you just sort of stay there. And just notice what... Now, for some people, some of my experience of with most people is they really, they are so, what we call, conditioned to cover it or to block it, that it's very hard for them to get to that place. Mm-hmm. Very hard, unless they actually physically end the experience itself. 
But most, but what most people don't really understand is that basically the experience is really going on in your head. And the physical aspect is just, it's almost like a mirror being reflected back to your, your thoughts. Mm -hmm. and, if, and I think most of us know that if you think a thought long enough of an experience, you will actually start to feel it like it happened yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And so while they're, while they're standing, have them go through that. Now, one of the most advisable things to do is in front of a mirror because most people don't like themselves. In our culture, everybody's trying to be somebody else. Yes. You know, and so the first thing is self-recognition and self-love of the self, not to a point of this pure ego, but from a point of view that you are part of creation. Mm. You know, you're, you, you, I mean, you're, you're, all, you're part of the mechanism that makes things move and work. You know, and you have a right to be here. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you look at yourself in the mirror, you say to yourself, and you ask yourself as you feel this fear, and notice how it comes into your body, notice where it focuses, focuses at a certain point of your body. And this is where the whole thing comes back, that I give myself permission to let go of this fear. Uh -huh. I give, and as you do that, as that area that you're doing it, you hold it and then you bring your arms out from it. Now, these, these principles of movement, simple, they may be very simple, but they are very powerful. And these are the principles of movement psychology. What I, what I have observed in the past 15 or 16 years is that movement psychology has a powerful impact on purging and getting people out of what we call the deep level of their subconscious. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very powerful practice. It's, I mean, it's one of those things, and usually these types of movements you can also find in Feldenkrais and Alexander techniques. I uh, use the term ATM, awareness through movement. Uh, there is something about the human body that we are missing here. I see so many people that are in the spiritual practices or ashrams and everything, and everybody's trying to leave the body. And right. the question is, how can you leave that something that you need to master? Right, the old right. ones, what they have forgotten is that they said in the early practices that learn to master your physical form right, before right. you move into the aspect of spirituality. And people, they keep doing the, up the opposite. They're running away so much from themselves, and they think that by going into those places that, you know, okay, it's great, until all of a sudden they find out that, oh, the, um, this stuff is here, and here. Oh, my God, i got to move on. And they keep running away from themselves. So right. the major objective is to really master yourself. So doing that technique and doing it in the mirror, and just giving permission and opening the arms up and saying it with declaration, with consistency, it changes. Um, in your book, you mentioned the four key principles of real happiness. Uh, would you like to talk about that? Yes. <laughs> uh, do you have it in front of you? I don't have the four principles in front of me. <laughs> um, I might be able to find them because the one, let's see, one of them, let's see, one of the, the key principles I'm trying to see it because um, I always attempt to stay new with what I do. Mm. You know what I mean when I say new, it's called the, be the beginner's mind. If we look at the first principle, um, be true to thyself. I know that's, that's one of the key principles of being true to oneself. And let's see. And that starts with really recognizing where we're at in our lives and where and the things that really just don't work for us, but we try to make it work because we don't want to offend daddy or mommy or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, the, you've got the OMAC principle, that, <clears throat> which consists of four stages, objective, motivation, action, completion of action. Is that, was that it? or, or No, that's the OMAC principle. That, that deals with uh, creating things in one's life by right. using that principle. Hmm. Now, we see a chapter on Journey to India. Yeah. That might be interesting to find out about. I have a friend that's in India right now. Um, when did you go to India, and what was that like? Oh, that was during the that was during the um, tsunami that happened in 2005. Oh, geez! 
I was up in northern India during that time. It happened in southern India. So what is India like? And and are there is it? I've heard it's it's a place of many changes. I mean, it, it'll just blow you away. It's so strange. Yeah, it's it's India like any other country that you go to. It, culture is different. It was, it was a major culture shock. Uh, um, but it was there was something very simplistic about the country. Mm. Really simplistic. Not really. I mean, there are certain areas that you would go to. There are the rich and uh, the real poor. And, and we're not talking about the kind of poor we see in America. We're talking about this dirt poor. Mm. You know, and literally dirt. <laughs> yeah. But it was a. It was a. I learned a lot about people. And one of the things I learned was what we call the the, the principle of um, the Baker's Dozen effect. Hmm. And the Baker's Dozen effect is this. Um, it is said by the old ones. And it's said by those who know the order of things that if you want to have a successful company, always give 10% to charity. Give 10% some way or 5% uh, in a way to helping others that are less fortunate. Oh, I agree with that. <laughs> and, I mean, what was very interesting about the Baker's Dozen effect was basically that when I went into the marketplace, and even though I couldn't really speak Hindi in any other dialect that much, um, each time that I would buy food or something like that, they will always give me something a little extra. Huh. You know, and I remember going into the marketplace and they'd say, hey, have some tea. Oh, come, come, come. I mean, if they didn't like you, they wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't care to deal with you. Just like, move, move on. Uh. You know, but their way was like, hey, have some tea. Uh. And sit down and have tea and we would talk. And there was a way in which the human factor was always a part of their business. Huh. You know, the baker's dozen is that I always give them more. I give them more. You know, I, I give them 13. Here in America, you get 11. <laughs> yep, right. You know. Right. right. Or less. Or <laughs> less, yeah. And so what people don't understand, that type of mentality, what it is, is um, the customer. There's a saying that, I, that a corporate guy told me. It's like, you know what? I believe in the old way of treating customers the way they're supposed to. Um, what we have now is a problem in what we call public uh, public relations, where people they they don't they have they very little patience with you, and they give this. And sometimes when you're in their presence and they're, and they're working with you and trying to sell you stuff, uh, the interest is not in you. And so we can't have that. He was dissent. He was saying that in order for us as a company to really be productive, we really have to learn, per, per, you know, personal relationship. We must understand the nature of people. We must yeah. serve the people first before the money. Absolutely. Absolutely. It seems that it's about making that personal connection, and that's what you know ultimately brings in or makes success. Definitely. But if you're focusing on the end result and the money, then the the people don't matter to you. And people can pay. people are not stupid. They can no. read. They can they can read where you're coming from. And it's like, yeah, okay, guy, yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like you, you you just can't do that. You know, it's it's just an, it's it's not. Um, we are human beings. Mm -hmm. And one of the most virtuous things that we can do as human beings is to love and respect each other, mm -hmm. even though we may not agree with each other. You know, we can still respect each other. Absolutely. I, I love this picture of you standing in front of the Taj Mahal. Uh -huh. Did you go inside there? Oh, that's a beautiful place. Is it? Beautiful what, place. What's it like? I mean, what was your impression when you uh, walked in through the front? I felt, uh, when I, as I was approaching, it was almost something out of a storybook. Really? <laughs> it's like, this place, this place has a tremendous amount of energy and history, and the walls have a certain vibration to it. Uh huh. The way that they had it cut off inside, you, there are certain places you can only walk to. Uh -huh. Then they had wire, sort of wide mesh around just to protect you from going any further and down, like and down into the uh, the, the cavern of the, the basement or whatever. Right. But it, the inside of the walls, the, these walls were reconditioned, some of them, and then there's other pieces that are just there ever since that, that place was created. And 
as you walk the marble, there is this awe of um, this person committing himself to dedicating this, you know, the, the love that he had and just sort of spending years and years and years of developing this. And it was an interesting place because I saw so many people. This is almost like it was like a Mecca where people would come in and um, I saw a student and a disciple there um, that he was teaching his, his young disciple and he, and he was, I heard him happen, happen to hear him talking briefly uh, about the, the whole aspect of this place and the energy of it is. And, uh, you know, and it's just, it was just a place of, um, of awe because it's one of the, some people call it one of the seven wonders because uh, it has this, this mystical, this majestic aspect to it. You know, there's something about it that the ground... You know, it's kind of hard to explain these things in a way because it's almost like trying to say it in Chinese or say it in, in Hindi and people are not really understanding it. And so it's like, wow, that sounds so beautiful. But when you're there, there's an experience of it that it's, it's, it's just something that you won't forget. Uh, magical and mystical and... Yeah. Spiritual. Definitely. Yeah, that there's, there's much more to it than... You feel you, the vibes of maybe thousands of years of of energy that's uh, gone into that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. <clears throat> so um, let's see now. What else do I want to ask you about? We didn't get the the four principles, but uh, yeah, we didn't get those. I couldn't find that one. Um. There's a few questions in your book that you've discussed a little bit. Um, what's your impression of today's human beings based on your years of experience? <laughs> mm, mm. Wow. <laughs> um, now, I know what you said in the book, but now you're going to have to figure out what you're going to say on the air. Well, here's the thing. Um, you want to phrase that question again? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's... Let's see if I can maybe phrase it a little bit differently. What's your impression of today's human beings and where they're going? Okay. I'll put it that way. All right. Um, and I'm only coming from my, you know, my short time. I haven't lived uh, completely 100 years or so, but um, being a teacher, it puts me in a whole different frame. I'm constantly, constantly, 24-7, mirrored. I'm constantly being mirrored back to. And I'm constantly seeing this aspect of human nature in the raw. Mm -hmm. And uh, it keeps me in check. Mm -hmm. It keeps me sharp. Um, it keeps me honest. <laughs> and one of the things that I've observed and what I, you know, in this present day, in this present society, is... Um, this thing of, um, how can I say it, it has a lot to do with uh, a lack of uh, honesty. Oh, yeah. You know, and the honesty is not so much as somebody lying to some, someone else, but it actually has to do with them lying to themselves. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I see that, too, everywhere. And it's almost as if they, they put on this pretensions, these pretend of... Um, grandeur of what they are and who they are and in truth um they're just lying to themselves yeah yeah and yep i i see a lot of that too and, and you know another thing that uh, i think uh, we're trying to we're kind of skirting around it is that um most people have turned towards or are focusing on material things and on uh, acquiring more material things, and as a result, they're not being—they're not really happy, and they're not really satisfied. And so, the spiritual aspect of the self is getting buried deeper and deeper inside of one's body. The soul, the spirit, is is not being expressed, and so a lot of people are feeling frustrated and angry, and they probably don't know why. I know, and pretty soon, as you start to acquire all I mean, it's nothing wrong with material mm -hmm. wealth. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the problem that usually arises from that is that when you make it your God or you make it something 
better than spirituality and better than divine connection because everything physically is transitory. Nothing stays the same. If it has a beginning, it has a preservation, and it also has an ending. Mm -hmm. And what people don't understand, if you keep trying to focus to try to get satisfaction in a material thing, whether it's a woman or a man or whatever, you will always wind up short because people will people that we love dearly will one day leave us. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, mm -hmm. It'll either be by way of death or we outgrow each other. You had one of your relatives uh, appear to you after he died, didn't you? Yeah. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, he, I believe that was my grandfather. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. He, Grandfather Pruda Morgan, uh, oh. he came and he was looking at me uh -huh. with this beautiful smile of approval. <laughs> Good. Um, and as he did that, um, he kind of, um, there's a way in which that was saying okay. Um, when that happened, that was very interesting because when that happened, my wife happened to also notice um, there was a presence in the room. Mm -hmm. And as he did that, he turned. And as he turned, he walked, you know, went through the wall. Um, I took that as a way of uh, connection mm -hmm. and a way of which um, he was concerned. He was concerned so much that the energy that took him to actually create that etheric body, that form, mm -hmm. you know, and just to say to me. And I knew it was him because I felt it, and, you know, it was just a feeling. He had a wide brim hat and, and uh, one of those types of uh, you, um, suits from the 40s, <laughs> you yeah. know. But, yeah, it was, but he was it, smiling. Yeah, he was smiling. It was a very interesting experience. So it sounds like he was telling you, I mean, just on the surface of it, that he was approving of, of, the, of your direction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he was he was saying hello, and I'm and then also telling you that he was fine. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Isn't that all, all in the same thing. That's wonderful. Now uh, you've been working with yoga for quite a long time. Now, what is your what do you consider to be the true yoga? That which is of the heart. Oh, wonderful! Yes, of course. You know, and that can be many different systems that may have it, but if it's, if there's no heart in it. And it's just all superficial, a bunch of uh, circuits, contortions. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to do um, a posture, um, tragasana, or a triangle pose, and do it with, with such perfect skill. It's another thing to take the yoga and use it in your personal life to deal with all types of adversities. Most people, it's easy to teach a person how to stand on their head, really is. Mm -hmm. but one of the most difficult things is teaching them how to stand on their own two feet. Mm -hmm. And so because of the commercialized aspect of yoga in our country, each time you pick up a magazine, it's always some thin, anorexic-looking female, blonde, blue eyes, mm -hmm. uh, always showing the image of this is what yoga is. And so uh -huh. most men think yoga is for women, when in truth it was actually designed to work with men in the early centuries. Wow, I did not know that. Because they, they were the ones that, you know, needed the, really. Most people in many, many centuries ago always felt that women always had a connection. And if you look very carefully, uh, I believe one of the uh, ancient uh, Chinese proverbs talks about whenever civilization falls apart, and whenever the structure of the family is lost, the female principle has is not present. Yes. When we come back to the female principle and mother in the household, the family will become strong. Yes. And the nation will thrive. But we don't have that. The female has been lost. It is a total imbalance. Oh, absolutely. In our, in our society. Absolutely. Don't you feel that the divine feminine is going to make a more dramatic uh, in, in appearance and infuse into our society if we're ever to balance ourselves? Most definitely. Yeah. Most de There's a shift coming. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you tell us about that. What's your perception of the shift? Well, I feel, pers I feel personally and also astrologically a lot of shifts uh, come into play. I mean, um, 
I'm not a master in astrology, but I just uh. study the basic principles of them. And, you know, like, for example, we have uh, Pluto that's moving into Capricorn, and that has a lot to do with change. It has a lot to do with government. Uh -huh. And there's other things that are going on also. I mean, but if we look at the things that are happening right now in our society, there are certain symbols because life is always speaking to us from a symbolic point of view yeah, all the yeah. time. And some of the symbols that we've seen, we've seen that uh, we've seen an imbalance of the power in yeah. our country. And yeah. dominated by men that are not too well. No, they're, they're not. You know, and so there's a way, there's, a, there's almost in a way that the female voice has been silent. Yeah. And, and they yeah. have not been able to speak out or, or bring a sense of balance to this. Or say, look, stop for a while. Look, you, you're going, you're really going in a place where it's going to create more more anxiety, more pain, more hate, or more hurt, and more death. And so I feel that as we move in this aspect of society, there's a way in which we have to look at, we have to honor the, the female principle. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you feel that these times, uh, I, I feel that they're um, more accelerated, and, um, you know, there are a lot of people who follow the Mayan <coughs> calendar in their time frame, which uh, says that in 2012 there's going to be an end to time when the galactic center lines up. Do you follow any of that stuff? Yeah, but what do they really mean? <laughs> See, <laughs> that's the thing. And the time can be your time of your death, of your physical death. Right, right. The time can be the time of a certain type of thought bomb. See, we have uh, what we call times of thought bombs where they're prevalent for hundreds of years and then at one point in time that particular thought is no longer prevalent and it cannot survive to the next millennium. Uh -huh. It cannot. And so what happens there's a major shift and change in consciousness. Now what I'm what I'm feeling from this uh, uh, 2012 is this basically there's an aspect of, of what we call a shift in consciousness uh -huh. that will take place among the people, the masses to such a degree that it will alter the way we used to do things. Yes, yes. And it seems that it would almost have to move out of duality and uh, out of the idea that we are separate and into more harmonic uh, thoughts and movement and that uh, we would be unable to create wars because we would see that you know, the person that we're creating war against is ourselves. Exactly. That everything, every, if, if, all, if all of us are from one spirit, then, you know, how can you kill another, for, another spirit if that's you standing there? Exactly, you know? exactly. So I think we're moving out of an uh, old paradigm, which has become really focused on greed and corruption, and I think that's going to break down, and, and uh, we're going to be seeing the, the birth of a new one. But it's definitely happening. I mean, you can only go so far into darkness until you start coming into light. Yeah, well, absolutely. And the darkness can't maintain itself. No, it can't. You know, it, it's, you know this whole concept of um, the religious right, right and this here mixed with you know, the, the politics and, and this stuff here and, and the mistreatment of people and... Um, you know, you can't continue to do that. No, and no. Because, you know, things will start to shift and change. And because of the level of consciousness of those of, that are, that are, those of us that are self-consciously aware, we cannot allow that. We can't mix. And so what we have done in, in many parts of the planet, there are many of us that have created this aspect of positiveness, yeah. uh, peace day, you know, the whole aspect of focusing your intention in your mind and you have action you affect the vibration in the very ethers of the air. Yeah. You know, and yeah. as you're holding that, people don't believe that. They figure that they have to go out physically to go out and just do something to make it happen. You can, you know, it doesn't have to work that way. First, it has to start on the subtle plane of your existence and, absolutely. and, and move into the physical. Absolutely. <laughs> if, if every listener to the show just, you know, focuses on peaceful vibrations and releases their negativity, then even that creates a shift on Definitely. the planet. Definitely. And you don't have time to, to send negative da daggers and negative um, what we call psychic daggers uh -huh. to Bush. He, you know, he, he doesn't really need that. If anything, he needs to be compassionate and love, even though, you know, we know where he's at. 
So, right, you know, but, you know, there's a way in which you don't feed that kind of thing right. by pretending not hate and negativity. Right. You feed it by nurturing. It only perpetuates. Definitely. And, and it makes things, uh, it, it perpetuates the fight. And it's not about the fight. It's about forgiveness and, you know, letting go and acceptance and allowance. And, you know, he, he's playing a role. Definitely. And uh, it's a difficult role. It's not one that I would want to play. But, um, you know, he's playing it really well. He should get an Academy Award for it. Yes, as a great actor. <laughs> really. Truly. One of the best. He's come from a long line of actors that have filled <laughs> that role. You know, you, know. But, you know, those are the kind of things that basically at this stage of, uh, of our country that, um, not to get into too much of the politics of it, but uh, there's a way in which um, we play a major role in shift. I was, I was looking on the $10 bill uh, today, uh -huh. and it said, We the People. And for some reason, um, we've forgotten that. Yes. We have to come back to We the People. Yes. Because it is us that yes. make this government. Yes. You know? We are the people. A lot of our forefathers have died in order to create this aspect of this particular world yep. called the United States. You know? and Absolutely. So we have to really honor and respect it, and at the same time, um, keep a vigilant and a focus point in the direction that is benefiting all people. Absolutely. And, and focus your heart on love. Definitely. And, and not judging anyone else because that's when we start going down that rabbit hole. Definitely. And it's you not know? the, you know, one of the things that most people can really get mixed up is like, well, you talk about love, is it just the passive love where they just slap you and kick you around? And, you know, we're not talking about that. No. You know? No. I mean, even the most cowardly animal, if you corner it, it will fight. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and so we're, not, we're talking about really understanding the nature of beings. Yeah. And realize that people do play a role in this world. Yeah. And you don't have to do something to try to go out of your way to try to hurt them because they're doing it to themselves. Yes. Absolutely. And somebody else will play out their karma. Yes, exactly. So don't be the bringer of their karma. Exactly, exactly. And don't create more karma for yourself. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Like trying to play God and, and, and uh, you know, judge and, and uh, you know, take care of that other person's situation. Yes, absolutely right. I, I'm glad you said that. Um, we're going to be running short of time in a minute. Is there? Are, do you have some lasting thoughts for us? Well, or? remember that uh, you can contact me on the web, okay. pathfinerinstitute.com. Okay. That's pathfinerinstitute.com. And my number is 925-695-3121, 695-3121. That's area code 925. I do uh, special workshops, uh, private sessions, um, and my old motto is this, that um, you got to have heart. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Dindale, where are you physically located in the country? I'm located in uh, Antioch, California. Oh, okay. So uh, you're actually, you're here, uh, you're not too terribly far from me. Exactly. Wonderful. So you people in California can check him out, and uh, he's a wonderful guy. Um, and I highly recommend your book, too, Lone Wolf and in the, the company, company of Fools and Mystics. And can they get that on your site? or at Yes, they can. They can get it on, uh, they get it more quickly if they go to my site. Okay. And um, get it on uh, pathfinerinstitute.com. Okay, pathfinerinstitute.com. Well, Dindale, it's been a wonderful time talking to you, and, and I really thank you for joining us and sharing your insights and, and your love and your spirit. Thank you. And I wish you the very best. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night, night Dindale. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.